What really matters now is that on the ground, uh, actual things happen rather than just words being said. That means heavy weapons need to be removed. It means a proper ceasefire has to be put in place. It means that people actually have to do the things that they've signed up to do. As you rejoin us on America's Forum, we're rejoined at the anchor desk by Miranda Khan, and we just heard from British Prime Minister David Cameron addressing the Ukraine peace deal and that ceasefire agreement reached this week. And the question on everyone's mind, is this deal a glimmer of hope for the Ukraine, finally? Joining us now, Ambassador Roman Papadouk, the former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine. Ambassador, we thank you for your time, and uh, we appreciate you joining us today from Newsmax, Washington. My pleasure to be with you this morning. Now, Roman, we heard of this ceasefire, and almost as soon as it was announced, fighting ramped up between uh, Ukrainian troops and the Russian-backed rebels. Not only that, Russian President Putin and his Ukrainian counterpart gave opposite accounts of how, uh, of how this uh, armed conflict is being resolved. What's the truth of what's going on in the Ukraine right now, in your opinion? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that it's very important that they did reach an agreement in Minsk uh, for a ceasefire, and there's a yardstick in terms of which you could hold the separatists and the Russians accountable to. But I would add two things. Number one, in terms of what's going on right now on the ground, we don't know if it's jockeying for last-minute positioning uh, because the ceasefire is not supposed to take place until uh, 5 o'clock, I think, Eastern Time Saturday. Uh, the second thing is you have to take a look at the total picture. We've been at this uh, point in the past. The first Minsk agreement in September of 2014 was supposed to lead to a peace process which didn't take place. What we saw during that uh, time span since then was a Russian buildup and greater support of the separatists and increased fighting which led the separatists to even increase the scope of the territory that they were holding. So right now, I would uh, kind of go along with what the British Prime Minister said. We'd have to see how this develops and see what the actions are on the ground. Well, we're hearing uh, France's president say that this is, quote, a relief to Europe, but there are still some questions that remain what the both sides agreed to. Can you kind of explain what happened during that 16 hours of talks? Sure, there was a, a little bit more of a concrete agreement in terms of what would take place. Uh, the previous ceasefire was open-ended. There was no date, uh, I believe, set when the ceasefire would take place. And when I say previous one, I'm saying, talking about Minsk one. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the ceasefire is supposed to take effect on Saturday at 5 p.m. our time. I think There's it's 4 o'clock. There's also talk of oh, 4 o'clock. I'm sorry. Okay, oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. You're correct. I stand corrected. Yeah, the, there are two different anyway, reports, anyway, conflicting it's, it's reports. Yes. Uh, that's that's okay. That's okay. Uh, the other thing is they've uh, put a time limit in terms of when the heavy equipment is supposed to be pulled back. It's supposed to start being pulled back on the 16th of February, I believe, and there's a two-week time frame for the pullback. There's also an agreement in terms of the political process this time, a concrete deadline. Ukraine's supposed to undertake constitutional reform and then hold uh, elections in, in the Donbass region uh, by the end of 2015, at which time the border would then revert back to control of the uh, Ukrainian authorities. So there are some concrete uh, yardsticks here or markers that have to be met that didn't take place in the first Minsk agreement. And as a result of this, I think the West will be able to judge whether or not uh, the separatists and their Russian supporters are really living up to the agreement. And I have to point out, this is, this is a very good procedure f uh, in terms of the agreement, because already we've heard Angela Merkel say that the sanctions that the EU uh, agreed upon this past week will take place and be implemented on, on Monday, February 16th. So the pressure is going to continue upon uh, the separatists and the Russians. Uh, Roman, you mentioned Angela Merkel, and we should note that Germany and France really brokered this 13-point peace plan. You served as our ambassador in the Ukraine. Uh, America taking a backseat on this. Is it good to let Europeans fashion this solution in Eastern Europe? About 45 seconds remain, sir. Sure. I, I think, uh, J.D., uh, the United States and in, in, uh, Europe have been...
uh, in a lockstep in terms of approaching this issue. Uh, the EU has taken the lead because the original agreement between Ukraine for Ukraine was with the EU in terms of Ukraine's membership in the EU. So the EU and Europe in general have a, a big stake in this issue. The United States has been very supportive in a number of ways. Number one, it's been unified <coughs> with, the, with the EU in terms of its approach to uh, the sanctions issue for Russia. And the United States has been very supportive in terms of the president now considering the possibility of providing ar uh, defensive arms to Ukraine, which is a uh, step up in terms of the pressure that the uh, West and particularly the United States And Roman, States we're going to continue undertake. our conversation right after this break. We'll have more with Roman Papadou. An agreement is a piece of paper unless it's implemented. And so what we've seen to date is that Russia and Russian-backed separatists have not taken the steps to implement. We will see what they do uh, from here. The State Department spokesman Jin Saki addressing this Ukraine peace deal. Yeah, the administration seeming to take a kind of cautious wait-and-see approach to that deal. Well, let's continue our conversation with Roman Papadou, the former U.S. Ambassador to the Ukraine, who joins us this morning from Newsmax, Washington. Ambassador, there is always, it, it's beyond skepticism, it's cynicism about an agreement uh, that involves Vladimir Putin. Can you, can you tell us why it might be in the self-interest of the Russians to agree to the ceasefire? Well, I can understand the cynicism because, as we mentioned in our previous segment, that uh, we've seen this play before in terms of the first Minsk agreement that uh, wasn't fulfilled. But I think that the situation has changed somewhat. I think there are a number of factors that are in play now that might uh, uh, persuade Putin to be a little bit more amenable toward a natural solution. And uh, I would just list them as, first of all, since uh, September, we've seen a deterioration of the Russian economy due to the sanctions that have been put in place. Also, very importantly, because of the drop in oil prices. But I would also add to uh, point out a number of other things, J.D. Uh, the Russians, while they built up the forces and sent in more equipment and sent in their own troops into, into uh, eastern Ukraine, in the battles against the Ukrainian military, while the Ukrainian military is undermanned and under-equipped, has been able to fight back. So the resistance from the Ukrainian military has been a lot greater, I think, than the Russians really expected. And the Russians are getting to the situation where their costs, both human as well as economic, are starting to rise, and their long logistical trail into the territory is starting to increase. So I think they're starting to reconsider whether the military solution is really going to be very successful for them in the long term. The other thing you have to realize is that the Ukrainian central government, the government has stood very steadfast, has not crumbled and not, has not cracked. So for the variety of reasons, I think the, the Russians are reconsidering their position at this point and may be a little bit more amenable toward moving forward towards some kind of uh, negotiated settlement. Ambassador, you mentioned um, Ukraine being under-equipped and also the economic impact those sanctions have had on Russia. So I have to ask you, the U.S. for quite some time has been weighing on whether or not to arm Ukraine and putting further sanctions on Russia. Do you think that the U.S. should do that? Uh, that's a very good uh, question, Miranda. I would add one point to my uh, previous comments, and that is that the United States has openly been talking about providing defensive arms to Ukraine. I think that's another issue that f factored into Putin's uh, mindset in terms of how to deal with this issue. So in addition to the sanctions and the drop in oil prices and the, the ability of the Ukrainian military to fight back somewhat is the issue of, of the United States providing, possi possibly providing arms to, 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 uh, to the Ukrainian military. Um, I, th I think that the sanctions issue has been important, and I think the United States is considering more sanctions. As I mentioned in the previous segment, the EU has already decided to implement additional sanctions. I could see the United States going in parallel with the EU in terms of any additional measures that might have to be taken. So I think the administration, both in terms of working the sanctions issue and in terms of trying to ratchet up the pressure on the Russians with the talk about providing defensive arms is working very closely with the Europeans and hopefully in a very successful manner that we can get a negotiated settlement here. 45 seconds left, Roman. Correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I seem to recollect that the administration has been perhaps overly cautious in getting the needed weaponry tr to the Ukrainians. Uh, in your mind, has President Obama uh, been overly cautious not getting defensive weapons in the hands of the Ukrainians? Well, there are two things here, J.D. Number one, I think the administration has already made a commitment to provide a number of types of equipment to the Ukrainians, such as night vision goggles, blankets, uh, uh, and uh, uh, tents, and et cetera. I think the logistical trail of that has been kind of uh, long and hasn't reached uh, uh, full implementation. And that's something that the bureaucracy is going to have to pay attention to and get moving. Uh, the other thing is the actual the provision of uh, actual arms, and that's still in a stage. And of we will keep our eye on that. House. Roman Papaduke, we thank you for your time. We'll be right back.